To the Honourable Member for Flamborough Glenbrook. Go ahead. All right, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always an honour to rise in this House and especially today to speak on C8, uh, an act to implement the certain provisions of the economic and uh, fiscal update. So, Mr. Speaker, Canadians are worried and frustrated. They want a plan for the recovery, they want hope, and that's not what they got from the economic and fiscal update tabled by the government on December 14th. Mr. Speaker, Canadians can feel the middle class dream slipping away, and this economic statement and fiscal update did nothing to address what's causing them to feel that way. If anything, it exacerbated it. Mr. Speaker, it didn't help the young families moving from Toronto and Peel region predominantly to flamborough glanbrook who are worried about the startling increase in the cost of living. It didn't help the small business owners that were struggling to keep afloat, nor the farmers who are putting food on our table, nor the seniors, and there are many seniors' villages in, in my constituency, uh, who, are, who built this country and who, who are living on a fixed income. So, Mr. Speaker, allow me to focus on four things this afternoon in this discussion of Bill C-8. One, the ballooning cost of living. Two, the housing crisis. Three, a disrupted supply chains. And four, a lack of a coherent plan for the economy. So, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about inflation. Canadians are feeling the pinch, and they're feeling at the grocery store, the gas station, in their home heating bills. Uh, Canadians have actually never felt more pessimistic about their financial future. And so take Gary from, from uh, Stony Creek Mountain, who's a senior who lives in, on a fixed income. And he wrote my office recently, he was gravely concerned, because every month more of his, he sees more of his income being spent on food and fuel. And so seniors like Gary, who've worked their entire life, who helped build this country to what it is today, they deserve to enjoy their retirement years. And it's something that the reckless policies of this government are robbing them of. Because, Mr. Speaker, inflation is its highest point in 30 years. And earlier this week, the Governor of the Bank of Canada suggested that inflation could remain as high as 5% for the first half of the year, 2022. But that 5% doesn't actually tell this whole story, because the price of chicken is up 6%, beef almost 12%, natural gas 19%, and gas for our cars, we saw the highest price ever in Hamilton and the GTA this past week, and that's up 33%. So those are the things that families need and depend on every day. And what makes matters worse, Mr. Speaker, is the government refuses to take any blame. And at first they blamed, uh, they, they told Canadians actually it wasn't really a problem. And then they threw up their hands and they said there was nothing they could do about it. But young families in my riding who are paying $1,000 extra for groceries this year deserve a better answer than that. So, Mr. Speaker, talking about the issues that affect young Canadians, which the government pretends to care a lot about, home prices are up, are up across the country 25%. The Realtors Association of Hamilton Burlington, in my area, said this week, in fact, they just announced this yesterday, that the average home price in Hamilton is now over $1 million. So, under this government, my constituents have seen the housing bubble grow to be the second most inflated in the world, up 85%. So, Mr. Speaker, how, how much can young Canadians see these prices go up under this government? It's no wonder that so many under 30 years old have completely given up the dream of ever owning a home. So, Mr. Speaker, another issue I'd like to address is the impact of disrupted supply chains. And that's having a great impact on our economy from coast to coast and our trade. It's not something that was sufficiently addressed and there were no solutions sufficiently provided in the fall economic and uh, fiscal update. And we know there are, there are complicating uh, factors, port congestion and ex exploding container prices. Uh, there's, there's labor shortages, of course, everywhere and across the supply chain, uh, as well as increased inputs for all facets of production. But on top of this, the government's dismissal of the truckers is again exacerbating the problem. You know, how can we make a dent in the supply chain backlog when a number of truckers are off the road? And they're outside the walls here, and they're frustrated and they want to be heard. Yet there's no dialogue, there's no olive branch from the government. 
And here's what it means to farmers and producers in my riding who can't get trucks to get their products to market. Mr. Speaker, I'll give you two examples of, of calls and conversations I've had in the last few weeks. Ray, who's a farmer in Flamborough, grows organic grains. And he grows organic corn and he grows organic soybeans and he mills that to feed, which is provided to chicken farmers in Pennsylvania and upper New York State, who in turn sell their organic chickens to restaurants in New York City. And it's a great uh, opportunity for all because uh, each of the, the uh, participants along that supply chain earn a premium on that product that the uh, consumers of New York are willing to pay. And so it's good for everyone. But, but Ray is frustrated because he can't get trucks to get the grain out of his bins. And if he can't get the grain out of his bins, he can't have the revenue to buy the seed he needs to plant the crop this spring, in turn for his crop this year, and he needs that cash flow. So Ray told me the whole process of trucks on his farm is contactless. The drivers are in their cab, the process is all electronic, and they don't even have to roll down the window. And so I think it's another example of these disruptions in the supply chain that are taking place across the country that were not sufficiently addressed in the government's uh, fiscal and economic update. And the response really has been a shoulder shrug. Another example, there's a large greenhouse operator in my riding, uh, and he uh, also said, you know, I need the trucks to get my product to market. It's perishable. And so on top of the labor shortages that he's dealing with, the dramatic cost of freight, which has increased, uh, the inputs costs that have increased, the packaging costs that have increased for him, he can't ship by truck. And so this economic and fiscal update offered no hope to Jan and the other uh, producers across Canada. Urgent action is needed. Which, which is why, Mr. Speaker, the glaring omission from the fiscal and economic update was any concrete plan for the economy. Where is the plan for the economic growth? We can see the plan to spend another $71 billion that we don't have, but where's the plan to grow the economy to pay for that, to create the prosperity this country needs so we can have more money to buy more goods and alleviate those inflationary pressures, to have the resources we need to invest in healthcare and ICU capacity, which we know from the pandemic is something that, that has been clearly lacking. So, Mr. Speaker, it should worry all of us that the OECD published a report the, sa the same week as the fiscal and economic update that said Canada would be the worst performing industrialized economy in the world in the year, in the decade, from now, 2020 to, through to 2030. So that's shocking. The OECD is saying that Canada will have the slowest growth of all the world's industrialized economies. So that's worse than Italy, and that's worse than Greece. And with all due respect to my, my Greek and Italian friends, they're perennial underperformers. That's not where Canada should be. So, Mr. Speaker, what's even more worrisome was a report that was out in January that said that Canada has the weakest private sector investment in our economy in years. Where is the business confidence? Where is that growth potential for the future that we need? Because it's private, private sector investment that's going to grow our economy, not government spending. And so the fact that this fiscal and economic update ignored that is something that doesn't encourage us. Mr. Speaker, it's yet another reason to vote against C8. No one works harder than Canadians. None of our OECD competitors have smarter people or people with more ingenuity. And we've got a great country blessed with resources from coast to coast. So the problem isn't us. The problem isn't Canadians. It's the economic end, uh, headwinds that we're facing. That's a problem of the government that's leading us. So CA doesn't offer any hope to change that. There is no plan to really unleash Canada's economic potential in this, uh, in this uh, particular piece of legislation. We can do better. Thank you very much.